Let me start um, with two questions, if I could. Um, the first is uh, we, we've talked about the opportunities for convergence of RCEP and TPP and, and more broadly TTIP, ZJK. But just focusing on, for example, RCEP and TPP, I wanted to ask um, principally, I think, well, all the panelists, if you want to answer, um, but since uh, Urata-sensei and Scott focused particularly on this opportunity for a convergence of um, the trajectory of RCEP and TTP, TPP, you described the upside of countries like Japan or Singapore ensuring that their disciplines uh, from TPP that are then taken into the RCEP process. But often people describe RCEP and TPP as two competing structures. So I wanted to ask you about the downside. Is there a risk, in your view, that RCEP could undermine TPP, that certain uh, prot protocols, procedures could preemptively be struck in RCEP and then undermine the effort in TPP for a high quality FDA? Um, uh, or is it mostly the question of whether there's a lost opportunity? Is there a, real, is there a chance of, uh, of, of, of these things actually coming at odds um, with each other? So, um, Scott, if you wouldn't mind taking the shot at that, and then Rats Tensei or others may want to chime in. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Well, uh, Petrie's study from the Peterson Institute outlined sort of what, what, the, what the big economic prize is for, uh, East, for Asia Pacific integration, and it's really uh, Petrie considered what would happen if, if these two agreements converged and, and that something between RCEP and uh, TPP became the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. So it's a, it's a big number in terms of GDP contribution. So there's, there's definitely a, an objective for growth. Um, I think small differences won't matter a lot. Small differences tend not to matter in the current noodle bowl because of big data. All right. One of the things the, the, the so-called spaghetti bowl, as Bagwati called it, or the noodle bowl, as it's called by my, uh, my Asia-Pacific colleagues, um, is, uh, is, an impo is a irrelevant concern, but on a practical standpoint, businesses can manage it because of the extensive data that's available in data management systems. So big data takes a lot of the inefficiency out of, uh, out of what's sort of built into the treaty. Um, now, trade diversion does happen. Trade diversion is a real phenomenon. And uh, any time you have a preferential arrangement where market access barriers remain for some parties but not all, you'll have some trade diversion happening. Uh, I think that's probably a concern at the margin. It, it is suboptimal, but uh, my experience is life is suboptimal. So, <laughs> um, Why don't we go down the line? I think everyone's interested in this question. Uh, yeah. Professor Chung. Yeah. Uh, personally, I, I think that uh, it's too early to talk about uh, the uh, emer uh, convergence of TPP and RCEP. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, at this stage, maybe two tracks uh, could be uh, parallel, and they will be uh, comprehensive. Uh, uh, they, they will be complementary, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, for example, you know that uh, some of uh, negotiators from TPP uh, they also uh, will be the negotiator for RCEP. Uh, I think that a lot of issues discussed uh, during TPP negotiation uh, will be bring to the pl platform of RCEP negotiation. Uh, that will benefit for uh, RCEP to become a high quality uh, FTA in the near future. Uh, meanwhile, I'd like to emphasize on you know, East Asia uh, economic integration process because uh, uh, China will be, you know, very important uh, member uh, for that. Uh, <clears throat> regarding East Asia uh, FTA, I think that uh, China-Korea FTA will be very important uh, uh, leverage for East Asia economic integration. Uh, uh, <clears throat> because, you know, that uh, China-Korea FTA, we already, you know, uh, studied for many, many rounds of, you know, feasibility. Uh, meanwhile, in recent years, China and South Korea economic uh, uh, relationship uh, becomes more and more important. Just a look at the trade date between China and uh, ROK. Uh, its, uh, its annual uh, trade volume already above 
250 uh, billion US dollars. Uh, if you look at trade data between China and Russia, uh, uh, lower than uh, you know 100 billion US dollar, but you know that uh, ROK has a so small uh, population and the territor <laughs> territory, so very high economic efficiency. Also, uh, our China and ROK, we are you know working on the East Asia uh, production network. Uh, of course, Japan is also uh, in, uh, working is also belonging to the, this network. So I, I think that. Uh, China Korea FTA will promote, you know, CJK FTA. Uh, because uh, if you look at CJK FTA, I regarded the CJK FTA uh, the uh, key, you know, the the key uh, uh, factor of East Asia uh, <coughs> FTA because uh, uh, CJK uh, three countries GDP, you know, uh, make contribution of Asia uh, more than seventy percent. Uh, just this number is enough. Uh, lastly, I like to say RCEP will be the most important platform for East Asia e economic integra integration. Uh, that will, you know, in maybe after several years, uh, maybe after 10 years, and uh, track one and track two, TPP and uh, RCEP, uh, relative members, they can sit together to talking about our Asia Pacific uh, uh, FTA. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> like I said in my presentation, uh, RCEP and, uh, and TPP are both regarded as uh, pathways to FTAP, and I think that's the way these two frameworks should be. Uh, in, but in my view, uh, high-level FTA uh, cannot be, I mean, in terms of quality, cannot be lowered. So it has to go from like uh, uh, RCEP to uh, uh, converge into TPP. And it takes some time uh, for several countries in RCEP or East Asia to, to accept the kind of high standard uh, you know, TPP has. Uh, so uh, we have to give them some time, maybe five years, 10 years. But gradually, uh, they can uh, grow economically. Uh, and then they'll be able to maybe, uh, uh, join TPP. And I think that's how it will be. If it's TPP is here, RCEP is there, and then gradually then converging to uh, FTAP. That, that's one point. And then another one is we should, I mean, they should use APEC as a platform. APEC is a you know, bo voluntary uh, uh, arrangement. Then they can show you know, best practices and so on. They meaning, I mean, RCEP can use uh, APEC platform. And maybe even uh, TPP countries can use uh, APEC pl platform to uh, uh, make RCEP countries to be able to maybe join in TPP later. Finally, uh, accession. Accession is uh, in RCEP, as, uh, although RCEP has just started negotiations, but according to guiding principles, uh, 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 East Asia uh, Summit mem uh, member countries do agree that uh, uh, RCEP uh, should be open to uh, others, but with one condition. Uh, this has to be ASEAN dialogue partners, according to guiding principle. I think that principle has to be relaxed uh, in order to you know, accept other members, such as maybe Peru, Chile, or whatever. So uh, whereas TPP is open not only to APEC uh, economies, but to others, so TPP is very open in that sense. So again, uh, ASEP has to make that adjustment in order to accept new members. <coughs> the reasons, uh, <coughs> again, the, the two RCEP and TPP, because, uh, um, because TPP is uh, exclusively uh, conceptualized and marketed in such a way that it is a trade liberalization uh, issues, while, uh, while the RCEP is in addition to trade liberalization, uh, trade mm -hmm. investment liberalization, but also community building as well as development process. But second point is that, is, is it possible? Of course it's possible. Um, for example, there is a precedent in ASEAN. When Singapore started these uh, bilaterals, uh, there are some ASEAN member countries disagree with it. But we have a, a principle, they call it uh, 10 minus X. So there is uh, one track is the, uh, for the 
10 kilometers an hour speed and the other one is 50 kilometers or 30 kilometers. So it is possible to have two tracks uh, system, but a coordination must be enhanced. It true, probably as uh, Urata-san mentioned it, APEC, because it's already a lot of the, both RCEP and TPP members are members of APEC. The last point is that the, uh, uh, the ASEAN, um, ASEAN uh, uh, centrality and def uh, default functions is very important in the sense that if ASEAN agrees, because it cannot be top down, but it must be from the bottom up because uh, uh, the TPP high standard and all this. Is. So ASEAN centrality and initiative is, is, is critical in this point of view. So it can be done. Thank you. Um, I mean, TPP, I think most of the participating countries would argue is about more than just trade liberalization. It goes to quite a few disciplines beyond the border. And, and even I think um, many participants would argue it also is in its own way a kind of community building process. Um, and I suppose it's possible to have overlapping communities. Um, Kevin Rudd talked about the Asia Pacific community. Bill Clinton talked about an Asia Pacific community. Um, RCEP's about an ASEAN centrality based East Asia community. And I suppose they don't have to be in contradiction. But it sounds like the consensus on the panel is in terms of the content of the negotiations, TPP process is much more likely to shape the content of RCEP in terms of agreements than the other way around. Um, and that's helpful for one low IQ American to, uh, to take away from the excellent discussion. OK, um, please raise your hand. And we have microphones around the station, please. Thank you very much, uh, Sherm Katz, Center for Study of the Presidency. I wanted to ask Professor Zhang if he would, he's on, yes? If, if, yes. if he would address a little bit uh, Professor Lim's point about presentation of TPP uh, needing to be moderated. The question is really about trade diplomacy. Uh, you, you describe several ways that the TPP is perceived in, in China. Uh, can you distinguish between uh, those perceptions just as following as a matter of fact from the proposal of TPP and, on the other hand, from things which U.S. trade diplomats have said? And uh, the goal of the question is to help us understand better in the coming years how we can, if we have not moderated, how we can moderate in the way uh, Professor Lim suggests. Do I make my question clear? Yes, sure. Uh, <laughs> how how can U.S. Uh, how has U.S. trade diplomacy uh, led to misperceptions or misunderstandings in China? Period. Uh, actually, I already mentioned uh, in my presentation uh, because uh, you know that uh, uh, for TPP issues in China now. <laughs> Uh, actually, it's very difficult for us uh, to get related information. Uh, you know that uh, because TPP negotiation uh, is closed, <laughs> they, they, they don't release any related information. We just, uh, you know, make our efforts to know what's happened for that. Uh, so this type of situation uh, make <coughs> makes in China, you know, a lot of Chinese scholars, uh, their works uh, are quite difficult. Uh, and uh, uh, information is quite limited. And uh, uh, what they can do is that uh, just uh, buy a piece of you know, paper or buy uh, uh, very limited information and to guess <laughs> and to make a relative judgment or to make some of conclusion. And uh, that costs a lot of scholars, uh, you know, uh, they can make not so appropriate conclusion, such as I mentioned. Uh, meanwhile, you know that uh, due to a TPP issue, uh, actually, you know, relative with a lot of aspects such as, you know, uh, diplomatic issues, uh, political issues, uh, security issues, uh, 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 something like that. So combined together, very complicated. <coughs> uh, so for, for different experts, maybe they are, you know, uh, they are in different fields. Uh, for economists or for those uh, strategists or for those, you know, diplomat, uh, diplomats, 
their, they have their different understanding on mm -hmm. the issue of TPP. So I, I think that uh, it, it's very natural in China mm -hmm. why there are so a lot of misunderstanding and perception. I hope next step maybe you know that we can uh, increase you know our you know uh, information exchange and our discussion. Uh, and meanwhile, you know that uh, uh, <coughs> uh, next year uh, China will uh, you know uh, host. Uh, 2014 APEC meeting. Uh, I think that's a very good platform for China and other, you know, TPP uh, negotiators uh, can exchange information uh, and to know uh, uh, what happened for TPP and uh, how to deal with TPP issues. Uh, lastly, I like to tell you that uh, uh, this month, uh, because Japan already declared to join TPP negotiation. And uh, the, minister, uh, the spokeswoman from the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China, uh, they expressed uh, their uh, Chinese central government uh, attitude. Uh, uh, she said that uh, uh, TPP 10 plus 3 and uh, 10 plus 6, all of them would be the possible approaches and platform for Asia-Pacific economic integration. Thank you. That was an important statement, and uh, I, I attribute that to Wang Yi's, um, Foreign Minister Wang Yi's understanding of Japan and of, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the U.S. And when security experts look at TPP, they see countries on a map, and they think of a chessboard. Um, and when trade experts look at it, they see competitive liberalization, but also they know how hard and ugly <laughs> these negotiations are. And your presentation really brought that out. Did you want to comment on what the U.S. should do to moderate what it says about TPP. First of all, trying to get the U.S. to moderate what it says about anything is a Herculean task. But if there, if there was a talking point you could give the new USGR to capture what you're saying, what would it be? Well, I guess uh, uh, the trade uh, diplomats or negotiators, uh, 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 the U.S. did not uh, uh, publicize it much. But the media and the publications, uh, uh, the that uh, accounted a lot of those uh, perceptions. But it's also the second point is that uh, it served China interests also because uh, China is also jockeying for leadership, at least in its neighborhood. So by accepting readily at this point, by saying that this is also the second chance for you like accession to the WTO in December 2001, but this one is not WTO of 180 over members. This is only the United States as the leader. So it means you're accepting the United States leadership. So therefore, it is not only involved on trade issues. So it's not that simple. It is also leadership, leadership issues. So therefore, as, uh, it will take both sides to conciliate. But uh, so uh, I th I, we heard inside the, uh, 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 next year, China will host the APEC meeting. China will use that uh, a lot, to, uh, but so U.S. must take active uh, uh, dialogue and, uh, and coordination with these issues because it serves both sides interests. Sorry, in the back by the wall. Thank you very much, Raymond Barrett from Power Global. Question for Mr. Zhang. Uh, you pointed out some of the conflicts between the TPP members and some of the issues. Any chance that you could point out some of the conflicts between the RCEP and the CJK members and some of the issues that you see there? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, uh, the conflicts will be existing uh, forever. <laughs> Uh, not only for TPP, but also for RCEP, CJK, even if for China-Korea FTA. For example, uh, uh, for China-Korea FTA, we already negotiated for uh, maybe f five rounds. Uh, however, you know that uh, uh, because uh, ROK uh, has negotiate, had negotiated FTA with the United States, so uh, from Korea side, uh, its expectation uh, is very high. Uh, they want to, uh, you know, to negotiate a high-quality free trade agreement with China. But uh, you know that uh, China now is in process of reform uh, and uh, opening up. Uh, uh, so China, for Chinese side, we want to promote FTA step-by-step. Step. So my suggestion to Korea side is that uh, 
according to China's you know experiences and China's uh, you know a gradual opening up you know experiences, it would be better if we can you know uh, we can go step by step at the beginning maybe the standard or the the, the quality is not so high the standard is not so high but uh, gradually we can promote it that will be you know very uh, coincident with China's situation. Uh, for China Korea, CJKFT also actually there are a lot of uh, barriers. Uh, for example, for Japanese side, their expectation is that uh, at the beginning we should put all you know fields on the table, all products, and we can you know have a comprehensive you know negotiation <laughs> for for FTA. Uh, but maybe China and South Korea have different understand for for this type of issues, something like that. So uh, I think that uh, CJK and RCIP will have, uh, you know, uh, it, it's, uh, there is a long way to go. But uh, right the countries, they already decide, decided to work together and to make efforts. Thank you. Mm. In the middle here. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Liu Zongyi from Shanghai Institute for International Studies. I'm a visiting fellow in CSIS now. Uh, I have a, a question to uh, Mr. Li. Uh, uh, just as you said, uh, the, TV, uh, the TPP was initiated by Singapore and several other uh, small countries. But at first, uh, I think the, the structure of TPP is just like a spider net. Spider net. Uh, but after United States initiated uh, T9, it, its structure has changed uh, into a hard spoken structure. And uh, just as you mentioned, the United States is the leader in this structure. But um, uh, Indonesia initiated the uh, receipt, and in the receipt, and in the uh, 10 plus 3, 10 plus 6, it's ASEAN countries plays a leading role. So I would like uh, to ask you, uh, how do you uh, think about, uh, how, how do the ASEAN countries uh, deal with your, your uh, inter internal differences? Thank you. So Professor Limbs, to Professor Limbs. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I think uh, um, the, um, when the P P4, uh, Chile, uh, Actually, it was P3, uh, uh, Chile, uh, New Zealand, and Singapore. Only Brunei came as the uh, later on, a year later. So it become it became P4. Um, secondly, is the the, the structure, <coughs> although it was not uh, elaborated, uh, the structure remains the same in the sense that uh, um, uh, it's a high level. Uh, uh, FTAs and comprehensive. Uh, so the purpose of it, as I interpret it, is the it was actually the Singapore idea and brought it to the Mexican when it was uh, APEC summit in Mexico. Uh, 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 former Prime Minister Go Chok Tong of Singapore uh, ideas of the uh, P3. Uh, so it's it's remained the same except it was not explicated into detail. So when the U.S. agree during the uh, uh, APEC meeting in Singapore in 2007, so U.S. Uh, uh, spelled out the beans and, and, and put it out all on the tables. So the principle remains the same. So what the, 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 the many people are still confused is that, uh, um, that, the, uh, um, that the, uh, the U.S. led and all these things, but actually it's the same principle, uh, except that uh, uh, U.S. Uh, uh, spell it out all in, into now 29 chapters. You know, the cross-border, horizontal, vertical, everything's uh, under the sky you put it in. But during the P3, P4, there was no such a specified area, but the principle remained the same. Now, the issue of the uh, ASEAN, how actually is not Indonesia. A lot of the things are actually initiated by Singapore, but it's quietly passed it on to Thailand or to Indonesia. Uh, but it was a Singapore idea, but of course it's not, I'm not from the government, I didn't say, but it's actually a lot of from Singapore. 
So uh, second point is that uh, it's, it's not a one country specific, it's an ASEAN consensus agreed by the ASEAN countries. So uh, the ASEP is not initiated by Indonesia. In fact, actually, there is, a, there is a conflict between the private sectors, the business communities, and the Indonesian government of uh, President Yudhoyono. Uh, Indonesian official position is very supportive of ASEP, but the private sector is not that keen at this point in time uh, because of Indonesia, as you know, growing very rapidly within its own domestic large market, they don't need so much of the expansion at this point in time. So, uh, but nonetheless, Indonesia official positions is that to support first the AEC, ASEAN Economic Community, and second is the ASEP. Okay? And uh, lastly is also Indonesia does not uh, uh, disagree with uh, Japan joining the TPP and all this, and doesn't have any specific ASEAN voice on TPP. Right here. Ernie Preek of Manufacturers Alliance. A number of interesting points today about the, uh, the trilateral FTA between China, Japan, and Korea, uh, which gets almost no attention in Washington, quite frankly. Uh, Korea and China are engaged in negotiations. For, uh, Professor Lim said China very strongly supports it. Uh, Professor Rada says Japan should contribute to quick conclusion and Professor Lim goes as far as to say that if Japan does enter into negotiations with the other two, and it could be a quicker, simpler negotiation uh, based on, the, compared with the TPP comprehensive, uh, 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 Professor Lim said, this is, this is for my question, that this would sideline the TPP. So my question is, uh, how would it sideline? How seriously would it sideline TPP? And uh, what, what should be the U.S. reaction if this new uh, element, uh, important element, comes on the scene. Again, this is uh, my personal view. So it's not, uh, but uh, uh, reflects uh, a great deal of the underlying ASEAN consensus to it. Um, uh, Japan and U.S. Uh, uh, do not have FTA, bilateral FTAs, while South Korea and U.S. has. Okay, so. The pressure, the pressure on Korea is not that big as on Japan. Mm -hmm. The third point is also that uh, a lot of the things that uh, it is, the, uh, Japan have a lot of commonalities that it should not be a, a problem on the 29 chapters of the things, but it's uh, more of uh, persuading the domestic constituency in Japan. So, uh, so sidelining uh, in the sense that because it is a, uh, a tedious balancing act between domestic constituency and uh, uh, and trade policy diplomacy on the part of Japan. So that sort of uh, interpretation that you should uh, uh, that it could be sidelined in the sense that balancing between domestic constituency, because uh, the Abe administration has to set up a credibility and political clouds domestically to push through pursue all the trade reforms, and uh, which I personally think it is the right way to restructure Japan and to uh, reboot uh, and to re-engineer Japan into uh, uh, um, uh, stronger economic growth. So that's sort of a sideline that I interpret it accordingly. If I understand correctly, Professor Lim, the issue you raise is that the Japanese government might use its political capital uh, to liberalize for CJK. Um, and have nothing left for TPP. Exactly. Um, Rata-sensei, I'd be interested in your reaction to that. Well, the CJK, uh, I think uh, my view is that uh, this is much more uh, e easier uh, FTA, uh, FTA than like TPP, partly because of uh, uh, maybe low-level uh, trade liberalization. That may be acceptable. Uh, because uh, China maybe doesn't want to open up uh, auto market, whereas Japan doesn't want to uh, open up uh, agriculture market. If you know that's 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 the case, then they can agree on not opening up. Uh, but in my view, you know, this is not uh, a good FTA, as uh, I guess uh, people are saying. But we need to uh, uh, promote economic growth, is to uh, uh, adopt, uh, you know, accept uh, reform and so on. So for Japan, if we can, op if China opens up a tra uh, auto market, 
uh, we should open up our agriculture market, although it may take some time, but that, that's a way that CJK, FDA should uh, you know, go forward. Uh, and then, I mean, coming back to this, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe is uh, using his, uh, I guess, popularity to uh, carry out uh, uh, agriculture reform. Uh, agriculture reform itself may not be so difficult if uh, what, what is needed is a determination and, of course, the appropriate policy. Uh, it takes some time for agriculture sector to adjust to new environment, but if you can formulate appropriate, po appropriate policy, that is a mixture of, uh, you know, uh, uh, maybe providing some kind of assistance to uh, 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 negatively uh, affected uh, farms, and then maybe uh, provide uh, some kind of, uh, say, R&D type uh, subsidy to agriculture sector, then, uh, I mean, uh, this structural reform can be done. Uh, and that's what uh, we like to see happen. And that's, I, I, that's how I'd like to see Prime Minister Abe to deal with this uh, agriculture policy. I mean, if I read the polls correctly, the Prime Minister announced he would join TPP before an election. His popularity stayed high, and support for TPP went up. Um, so in terms of mo political momentum, um, he sure seems to, ha to have it and the confidence um, across the LDP leadership. The, um, the rank and file, uh, backbenchers in the LDP have opposed it, but the leadership across the board almost is, is supportive, as I understand it. Um, this yeah, yeah, so he, he, he should take this really good opportunity. If he misses this opportunity, uh, this, you know, this kind of opportunity may not come back again, so this is the time. I would personally be surprised if the, if the Abe administration squandered his political capital on CJK, um, just given, frankly, some of the tensions <laughs> right now uh, between Japan and Korea and China, uh, but also given the Abe administration's worldview. Um, but I, so the danger, I would think, would be if you have a different cabinet, different makeup, um, uh, which is always possible in Japan, as recent history shows. I think we have time for one more. Um, yes, ma'am, did you? He did, oh, sorry. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Eric Love with the Free Observer. Actually, my, my question is a little bit uh, maybe directly to Mr. Miller. It's more like um, the problem with uh, the TPP is seems to be um, there's a bit of uh, not uh, enough transparency and uh, on this thing, and people doesn't know what it's about. You know, like actually, I, I was one of those who uh, entered into a, a press conference when the Japanese delegation come to come to come to Washington and found out that there is not a lot of information about the situation. A lot of people even, even read it. So, um, and also the point is that it has to be rectified so quickly in, 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 in difference to the uh, uh, RECEP, which is, um, is there a, a kind of uh, a hurrying to get this over with or is there need to be more uh, consultation when, when more people know what uh, the, 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 the deal is all about? Thank you. Transparency is always in the eye of the beholder. All right, there's a tremendous amount of information in the public domain about the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Uh, certainly the, the, the agreement ratified among the original four parties is a public document. The actual negotiating positions of the 12 economies or 11 economies involved uh, are not public and have never been public to my knowledge in any trade negotiation. So uh, I would just, uh, I would need, we'd need to have a much more detailed conversation on what you actually mean by transparency for me to give you a, a, a fair answer. But, but I think, you know, look, if you want to know what the United States is looking for in the trade agreement, go, go online, fill up your printer with paper, and print out the U.S. Korea Free Trade Agreement. That's the most recent FTA we've done with an Asian partner, okay? That'll tell you pretty much what our sensitivities are and what our interests are, okay? And it's all there. It's actually USTR.gov. You can download the whole thing. Uh, take your thumb drive. So, uh, so, so we can we can talk more about transparency. But what what often gets criticized and uh, as untransparent is the fact are the private negotiations among the parties, which always take place in private. At the WTO, they take place in private. In RCEP, they take place in private. Okay. So, uh, and any bilateral negotiators meet in private because they're exploring options. There, there's lots of reasons for it. Second, on pace. Uh, there, it's important that, uh, that, the, that negotiators agree to aggressive or ambitious timetables. Uh, they don't always make them. 
I would point out that the uh, when the Doha round was concluded in November 2001, there was a three-year mandate for completing the negotiations, and that didn't exactly work out. Uh, so uh, all these things are a little bit elastic. Uh, I, I do think with J with Japan's entry that the fall 2013 date is probably impractical. Uh, having said that, uh, my own uh, my own uh, observation is that few things in a trade negotiation actually improve with age. Okay, and you're better off setting a timetable and having leaders agree to a timetable and force the negotiators to come to conclusions, make the decisions, and move on. Uh, so there's there's a balance that has to be struck. Uh, November, October 2013 was a was a, a goal stated before Japan entered, and uh, negotiators I think would rather have rather have Japan in than have an agreement concluded on in this uh, this fall without Japan. So all these things are negotiable, but but I do believe that that it, that the, the the leadership in pace scope and timetable are vitally important to a successful conclusion. Otherwise, we get another Doha. And the October 2013 agreement was also heavily copied, right? It was substantially oh, yeah. completed and substantially is also in the eye of the beholder. And you heard from Senator Cardin, their next hearing for the Asia subcommittee is going to be on trade and economics and heavily focused on TPP, I'm sure. The new USDR is going to have to be confirmed. My impression, we may have colleagues from the Hill there, my impression is Japan coming into TPP has woken up the Congress yeah. to, and interested a lot of constituencies in a positive way who weren't interested before in TPP because it's a lot more than just Brunei now we're talking about. And, and so there's a lot of interest, most of it positive, and I think you're going to see a lot more hearings um, and a lot more information getting out. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. It's, a, it's, it's Clearly, it's a much bigger deal when, you, when yeah. you include one of your largest trading partners all of a sudden, where there are still substantial, I mean, Canada's a big trading partner, but there are very few barriers to the terms of trade. There's real barriers to trade between the U.S. and Japan that have to be dealt with. That's a big market access opportunity for exporters. It's a big opportunity for uh, for investors and people who want to engage, country, companies who want to engage in Japan, but that's going to take some time to work out. Um, we have, we've been talking about New Zealand butter and cognac potatoes, and I'm hungry. Um, we don't have either of those back there, but I think we have something reasonable. So we'll take a break. You can get your lunch, um, and in about 20, 30 minutes, we'll invite um, Assistant USGR Wendy Cutler. So please join me in thanking a really terrific panel.
the administration, um, Assistant USTR for Japan, Korea, and APEC, uh, Wendy Cutler. Um, I mentioned, Wendy, that we structure these programs with JETRO so that we have a speaker from the Hill first, and then we have regional perspectives so that throughout the morning we build up the case for how impossible your job is, and then you come in and you convince everybody you can do it. And uh, in, in Wendy's case, she absolutely can. Um, Wendy's really uh, well-liked and respected. Um, when I was in the NSC with the Asia job for Bush, people said, thinking back on the first Bush administration, you know, get ready because the NSC and USTR are going to fight like cats and dogs. And I don't think we had a single disagreement, maybe because you're so persuasive, but um, uh, Wendy is very um, effective. Um, the amazing thing about Wendy is when I was in government, and I went to Korea, um, every once in a while there would be a poster of me um, with a sign saying, "You are go home. <laughs> so the security guys working on the alliance were told go home. But Wendy has, after negotiating with the Koreans and successfully completing the chorus, the U.S.-Korea free, free Trade Agreement, Wendy actually has a cult following in Korea. Um, uh, no joke. And uh, I don't know how many Twitter followers you have, but it's uh, something. So uh, I'm sure the same will happen uh, in Japan. Um, and Canada and Chile and Peru and everybody else in the in the uh, TPP process. Um, uh, we'll invite Wendy up. She's going to give some uh, remarks uh, and then we'll take questions. Um, but join me, please, in thanking Wendy Cutler for joining us and giving us her remarks. Well, thanks a lot, Mike. Um, it's really um, a pleasure to be here today. Um, what Mike didn't mention was that um, through the years I've been invited to this forum, um, and I think the last time I was here was maybe about five years ago, and I can tell you the turnout was a lot smaller, <laughs> and I think this issue just wasn't as hot as it is now. And so um, I'm delighted to see um, so many of you here and I'm delighted to talk about regional economic integration. Um, I know this morning you had some really interesting discussions on the RCEP and TPP and how all this fits together. Um, I thought what I would do is just kind of touch on some of those issues, then really focus on the TPP, and then talk more about what Japan's participation in the TPP not only means for the United States, but what means for Japan and what it means um, to the region. Um, it, it's very clear that the whole issue of regional economic integration um, has just become um, a very um, popular issue. And if you pick up the newspaper just from this weekend, um, um, you can read about the conclusions of the first round of the RCEP negotiations. Um, we also note that the China, Japan, Korea um, FTA negotiations have been um, um, holding sessions with their latest session at the end of March. Um, I was in Indonesia a few weeks ago for the APEC trade ministers meeting um, where APEC continued um, its quest to work on trade and investment issues, kind of laying the groundwork for a lot of these next generation trade issues. Um, and at that time also, the TPP ministers met um, and officially welcomed Japan into the TPP um, pending the completion of each country's domestic procedures, and I'll get to that um, in a minute. Um, another um, um, regional grouping that we don't hear as much about, but clearly the last APEC meeting we did hear a lot about, is the Pacific Alliance, which is going to meet at the end of this month where they are planning to consider expanding their membership. And I will say today, we are um, TPP negotiators are on a plane as we speak um, to um, Lima, Peru for the 17th round of the TPP. Now, why all this activity? I think it's pretty obvious and not surprising. Um, there's um, a lot of dynamism and strong ep economic growth in the Asia Pacific reason, region. So it's only natural that there's a high level of economic engagement um, and efforts to really um, strengthen integration. Most countries in the Asia Pacific now are working to one degree or another to strengthen economic integration, and many of them are doing this in multiple fora. 
And while some have argued that some of these fora are mutually exclusive and somehow at odds with each other, um, we don't believe that. Um, we see these groups as potentially being complementary and all moving towards the goal of trade liberalization, perhaps at different paces and perhaps not as um, deep or as high standard as others, but clearly moving towards trade liberalization and ultimately moving towards the free trade area of the Asia Pacific. For the United States, um, it's no secret that our main trade negotiating focus in the region is TPP. Um, working with our other TPP partners, um, we are trying to craft a comprehensive high standard agreement which addresses what we call the next generation issues facing the region. First, let me just touch upon a couple of these points without getting into the details of the TPP negotiations. First of all, we believe it's important that for economic integ integration to be successfully achieved, you really need to have a comprehensive and high standard agreement. We recognize um, that ambitious trade negotiations can be challenging, but we believe the relevant economic research underscores that high standards are in the interest of each TPP country and in the region itself. And studies have projected that the benefits of TPP will be especially significant because of the breadth and the depth of the commitments we're seeking. Second, the TPP is adding new issues um, to the trade agenda. And we think this is very important. APEC has done a really good job of kind of laying the groundwork for these issues, whether they be regulatory coherence, supply chains, um, or dealing with small and medium-sized enterprises and integrating them more effectively into the training system. And these are the kinds of issues that, as the region and trade and investment um, progress in the coming years. These are the types of issues um, that we're hearing from our business community are extremely important. And so we think it's important that these issues now be folded into trade agreements. We are also developing the TPP as, as a living agreement and as a potential platform for broader regional economic integration. And um, over um, the past few years, we've invited other countries into the TPP based on their expression of interest and working with the other countries to join. Um, TPP was initially P4, and then the United States and a couple of other countries joined, and it was expanded to nine. And now we're at 11 members and on the eve of Japan joining the TPP. And so soon we will be 12. So let me now just turn to Japan and Japan's interest in TPP. Japan's interest was first announced um, officially um, in November 2011 in Honolulu when the United States um, chaired APEC that year. And it was a very um, um, striking announcement and people were very excited about Japan's announcement. And following that announcement, the United States undertook extensive um, stakeholder and congressional outreach. And we started our negotiations and consultations with Japan um, February a year ago. Um, the February a year later then, on, on February 22nd, when Prime Minister Abe um, was in the United States meeting with the President, um, they had a discussion about TPP. And following that meeting, we issued a joint statement, um, which for the first time put in writing that Japan was prepared to put all products on the negotiating table, meaning agriculture and um, industrial. And Japan was willing to join others in achieving a comprehensive and high standard agreement. And these, um, this statement was very important um, to the United States and other TPP countries because it clearly demonstrated that Japan got what the TPP was about and recognized that to join the TPP, um, that it was going to be different than the other EPAs and FTAs it had entered to date. The joint statement also underscored um, the remaining work we had to do um, with respect to our bilateral consultations. And we then picked up the pace and the intensity of these negotiations, 
resulting in an April 12th announcement of the completion of our bilateral <coughs> consultations. Um, at that time, we announced um, actions, assurances, and really a roadmap on a number of, of key issues that I'd like to just touch briefly upon. Um, first, with respect to the automotive issue, um, we reached an agreement that U.S. tariffs on motor vehicles would be phased out in accordance with the longest staging um, for any TPP product and would be backloaded, meaning the cuts would happen towards the end of that staging. In addition, we agreed on terms of reference um, for a parallel bilateral negotiation on automotive issues that will start when Japan joins the TPP and the results of which will be incorporated into um, our bilateral market access schedule with Japan. We also um, reached agreements on how we would treat the J insurance issue, um, particularly with respect to the J Japan Post concern. And that has to do with the, 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 um, the competition between a state-owned enterprise, Japan Post, um, with private sector companies. And we agreed that through the TPP consultations themselves, coupled with our bilateral parallel negotiations, we will address the level playing um, concerns. And furthermore, the Deputy Prime Minister um, of Japan announced Japan's decision not to approve applications by Japan Post for certain insurance products um, until equivalent conditions of competition have been met, as well as um, until Japan Post had a properly functioning um, management system. Third, we also um, announced that we'll have parallel bilateral negotiations on a range of non-tariff measures, some sectoral and some cross-cutting. Um, these negotiations will also start when Japan joins the TPP, um, and the issues will be addressed um, at the conclusion of our discussions with Japan in the TPP. And finally, in our consultations, we spent a lot of time with Japan exchanging information and letting them know about um, the negotiations themselves, and particularly with respect to what the expectations would be um, should Japan join the negotiations. And we had several rounds where our negotiating leads met with um, Japanese experts to go through the issues in detail but in particular focusing on issues that to date had not been addressed in Japan's um, FTAs and EPAs to date. And through that process, we were able to conclude that Japan was ready for this negotiation, that it understood not only the U.S. expectation, but the expectations of other countries, that it would be a constructive and positive participant in the TPP, and that not only would it not slow down the negotiations, but in fact, in many areas, would really be a good partner in, in really lifting the standards and working with us to lift the standards of the TPP. Following um, our conclusion of bilateral consultations with Japan, um, other TPP members then finished their bilateral consultations. And then in Suribaya um, on April 21st, all TPP members officially welcomed Japan to join um, the TPP negotiations with the METI minister act and Motegi actually joining the other TPP ministers, um, um, recognizing that each country had to complete their domestic procedures. For the United States, the domestic procedures means that we need to have an intensive 90-day period um, of consultations with Congress and with our stakeholders. Um, this period started um, on April 24th upon our return from Suribaya through an official letter um, to Congress explaining um, um, our intent to start negotiations with Japan in the TPP. We are now in this consultation period, um, I don't know, about two weeks or so into it, maybe a little more, and we're having those consultations with Congress and with our stakeholders. We issued a Federal Register notice last week inviting public comment. Um, comments are due June 9th in case anyone wants to share their views with us. 
and we'll be holding a public hearing on Japan's participation in the TPP on July 2nd. So those are just some um, kind of the process. And let me then conclude by just making just some observations um, about Japan's participation. Um, first, I would just stress that we've really had in-depth and detailed consultations with Japan and with our stakeholders. Um, for the United States, we, Japan is our, um, our fourth largest trading partner, um, the third largest economy in the world. We've had a history of trade friction, which in recent years has turned increasingly to cooperation. Um, but we needed to make sure that we got this right, and so we took our time in these consultations to make sure that there was a real meeting of the minds um, on the issues and, and on, on concerns that we brought to the table. Um, based on the work we did with our Japanese colleagues, we feel I'm confident um, that we have the necessary upfront um, assurances and actions and a roadmap for addressing the issues that have been brought to us of concern, um, as well as working with them through the TPP. Second, um, I would just say that Japan, um, that over the years we've seen more and more cooperation with Japan. Um, for me personally, I'm also responsible for the APEC portfolio. And frankly, most of our APEC um, initiatives now um, are co-sponsored with Japan. So whether it's localization or environmental goods and services or supply chain issues, Japan is with us um, um, hand in hand working with other APEC countries on these issues. And that's extremely encouraging. And I would also note that in the WTO, Japan's a very strong partner with respect to the information technology agreement negotiations as well as in the services negotiations. And so based on all of this um, and based of, on, on our continued cooperation with Japan, we think that in many areas of the TPP, um, not limited to, but in such areas as IPR, services, investment, and customs issues, um, they will be um, a very strong partner um, in the TPP. Third, we recognize that moving and opening up um, the agriculture sector is going to be difficult for Japan. Um, but we're very encouraged that Japan has had a national debate on this issue, that Japan has um, agreed to put all products on the table for negotiation, um, and that it's also having very detailed discussions in, in, are being held on, on um, agricultural reform. So all of this suggests to us that Japan is very serious about moving forward um, in this sector. Fourth, we are encouraged by Japan's special negotiating structure for TPP. Um, as someone who's um, negotiated with Japan for many, many years, um, it's no secret that at times you felt that you were, as you were dealing with um, as you were negotiating with different ministries, they might as well have been from different countries because they didn't have the same position. Um, and um, this time around, Japan seems to have gotten the message, and they are um, organizing a special negotiating team out of the cabinet office under the prime minister's leadership. And we think this is extremely encouraging in terms of minimizing rivalries and different opinions between ministries but also allowing for political decisions to be made, um, which we know through experience um, that negotiations like the TPP often require. And fifth, I would just underscore, and this is something I learned from the US-Korea FTA, is that it's, it's just so important that in these types of negotiations that a country that decides to um, embark on them makes its own decision based on its own national interests and doesn't feel like a trading partner pressured them to join a negotiation. And so we are encouraged that Japan has had this national debate on TPP. Um, there was a poll just this week, I believe, in the Yomiuri saying that um, TPP enjoys 55% um, public support in Japan. I've seen other polls come in a bit higher and a bit lower. But it's, it's fascinating, the debate that's going on in Japan on TPP, how it's on the front page of the paper every day. Um, and people are really talking um, about the issues. And 
I think Prime Minister Abe's speech on March 15th when he announced Japan's decision to join TPP <laughs> really underscores um, the, the, the Japan's rationale for joining TPP, which talked about improving Japan's economy, which talked about joining in the regional rulemaking, um, which talked about not wanting to be left out of other prefer preferential arrangements being negotiated in the region, and talked about strengthening our bilateral alliance. Um, and so we are very encouraged that Japan has made this decision, and we think as such, when it comes to the negotiating table, it's coming to the table for, um, for, for right reasons and reasons that will make um, the prospects for success um, greater. In short, we're excited about Japan joining the TPP. We believe it will contribute to the economic significance of TPP and has huge potential to support additional U.S. exports and U.S. jobs. But we also recognize that this is the beginning of a process, that we really have hard work ahead of us, both with Japan in the t actual TPP negotiations, but as well as in our parallel bilateral negotiations on autos and other non-tariff measures. And at the same time, um, on the TPP more generally, we've had, we have had 16 increasingly productive rounds of negotiation and literally are about to embark on the 17th round in Lima, Peru. And with the TPP negotiations in such an advanced stage and progressing towards conclusion, um, we, as the United States, are committed to working very closely with Japan to integrate Japan smoothly into the TPP negotiations, as we have successfully done with Canada and Mexico. Thank you very much. Um, thank, thank you very much, Wendy. And, uh, uh, you know, important takeaways for me, and I think for others, will be um, that TPP is not in competition with these other efforts at economic integration, uh, that partners don't get pushed into this. Partners decide if it's in their national interest and why it's in their national interest, and then we go from there. But I think the most important in a way is that after uh, so many years of experience working with Japan uh, and watching what's happening, your assessment that it, it's real. And, and with Japan's participation, TPP becomes a much, much bigger thing. Um, we'll open it up. I wanted to ask you something based on our discussion this morning. Um, a number of speakers, including Chairman Ishige, noted that we have to have some mechanism to um, ensure that TPP, RCEP, China, Japan, Korea, that these are um, moving in the same direction. And, and, uh, and reinforcing each other as much as possible. And there were discussions of whether China should be an observer in TPP or there should be a trade minister session. Um, I remember at one point we tried in APEC to have um, different ministers um, explain what they were doing. But how, and that's a little maybe beyond your immediate target of negotiating this, but how would you respond to that suggestion that we need to find a way to, um, if not coordinate, at least um, share some information among these different hopefully complementary efforts? Well, we already are doing that in APEC. Over the past couple of years, um, at the senior officials level, um, at every senior officials level, at every senior officials um, meeting, we are exchanging information on um, the different negotiations. And it was interesting, when we first started this process, that was in the Honolulu year when we chaired because we thought this was important. We literally had to kind of behind the scenes ask countries to, you know, to take the mic and to, you know, report on what they were doing. And now this has become an, just an integrated feature of our meetings that we really have, um, have had a robust discussion um, on the respective negotiations in the region. And I would just also say in Suribaya, under the leadership of Indonesia just a few weeks ago, the trade ministers um, had a special luncheon devoted um, to this issue, really exchanging information, updating each other on the, their respective negotiations. And, you know, looking ahead in APEC, I think, you know, the remainder of the Indonesia year, when we look to the China year, I think they're just, you know, really strong opportunities to really increase the transparency um, with respect to these negotiations. I hate it when think tanks come up with really great ideas and the government's already doing it. But, uh, <laughs> but thank you. Do you want to take credit for it? <laughs> it's already, you already outed us, but thanks. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's, it's a contrast to when we were both working on APEC 
say, six, seven years ago, and the U.S. and some other countries made an effort to have this kind of, um, you know, sharing of information on, on FTAs, and it was, it was too sensitive at the time. Uh, people weren't sure if these were going to be in harmony or not, and so that's an encouraging development. Let me open it up. Please uh, briefly uh, in introduce yourself, Urata-sensei. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I have a question about agriculture. Um, well, two related questions. Uh, you know, uh, we hear about LDP politicians talking about you know sanctuaries and the five agriculture products has to be removed from the uh, negotiation. Uh, th does this kind of uh, development affect the uh, consultation with the Congress? Uh, you know, after 90, 90 days, can we expect the, uh, the approval of Japan joining TPP negotiation? Or if they keep hearing these negative views, then they may have a second thought on this? That's the first question. And the second question is that you told, about, told us about the uh, uh, agreement on auto. U.S. Uh, will, uh, you know, uh, I mean liberalize auto uh, with uh, several years. Uh, and uh, did they talk about the agriculture, how uh, Japan should deal with agriculture in that regard? Uh, what I'm worried about is, uh, as I said in my presentation, I'm in favor of opening up agriculture in Japan. That is very important for Japan to recover economically. But uh, uh, you know, all this agreement on auto may be based upon the uh, 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 understanding that Japan doesn't have to open up uh, agriculture. If that's the case, you know, uh, that's really uh, something that I, I, I'm very, uh, I hate to see happen. So these are two agriculture-related questions. Okay, well, let me just say that during this consultation period, um, I'm spending a lot of time in Congress and with our stakeholders. And so, yeah, statements come out um, by different parties um, in Japan, such as the LDP <coughs> saying that they want a handful of products excluded. You know, this complicates our consultations, and we have to explain, you know, our view on, on what was said, as well as our understanding with Japan on these issues. And with respect to this issue, we point to the February, February 22nd joint statement where Japan clearly said that all goods will be subject to negotiation and that Japan would join um, others in seeking a comprehensive and high standard outcome. Um, with respect to your second question, um, the results of our consultations are public and so they're there for everyone to read. Um, and so what we achieved on autos um, is uh, I touched upon. And what we um, um, discussed on agriculture um, is also captured there, which once again is reflected mainly in the February 22nd joint statement. Thanks. Mr. Chairman. Thanks very much, Wendy, and thanks again for your years of great work at USTR. Um, this morning we talked a little about some of the downside risks related to RCEP and CJK. And uh, I wonder if you can sort of, you, you've, done, you've described very good things that you're doing to share information. But I wonder if you'd take off your official hat for a minute and tell us what some of the downside risks are. We spoke about a couple. One, that RCEP might be a lower level uh, less ambitious in many respects, A, B, that it's more oriented, some said, toward economic uh, development. Uh, and some thought this could perhaps slow down the TPP process. Others said, no, no, uh, RCEP's going to have to graduate up into uh, TPP. And then there was also a CJK. There was a concern that perhaps if Abe moves to, that there might be c competition for use of Abe's political goodwill as between CJK and TPP. Uh, speculate a little with us on the downside risks, if you'd be so kind. <laughs> um, I'm going to just be really brief in my response, because I never really take my official hat off when I'm giving public speeches that the media is filming. <laughs> And that is really just to emphasize more what the TPP is about. And for the U.S., once again, we believe that really high standard, comprehensive agreements 
um, uh, you know, based on the economic analysis we've seen, would just bring more benefits um, to the region. And that's why we are working so hard in the TPP to work with other like-minded countries to really lift those standards, to address kind of the next generation issues, um, and, to, and to achieve a comprehensive agreement. I'm going to call on someone here, but I just want to point out that Wendy is a graduate of Georgetown School of Foreign Service. I know there are at least half a dozen Georgetown students in the audience, so you know, don't let us down. <laughs> but for now, yeah. Thank you very much. Raymond Barrett with Power Global. Uh, the issues like, say, autos and say, agriculture have been covered to death a small bit at these events. So maybe if we could expand onto some of the kind of, say, say other areas and things that you mentioned in the say, release were some kind of uh, NTMs, like, sort of, say, uh, investment into Japan. You sort of highlighted uh, mergers and acquisitions. And, and any chance that you just expand on what the U.S. is trying to achieve in terms of, say, M&A into Japan. And I, I, I think you mentioned the way boards are structured in Japan and those things, just something other than autos and uh, agriculture for a change. OK, let me just say that w we thought it was very important that um, given Japan's low tariffs with respect to industrial products, um, that we would have the ability to really address non-tariff measures that our exporters and workers and companies are facing in Japan. Um, some of these non-tariff measures will be addressed through the TPP negotiations. Um, the TPP, 29 chapters, a lot of them are dealing with non-tariff measures. But we also recognize that there are a lot of kind of Japan unique um, non-tariff measures that we've had to that we've dealt with in the past, but also through our um, stakeholder outreach, more were identified. And as a result, um, we have um, a pretty ambitious agenda with Japan. Um, as you mentioned in the investment area, one of the key investment concerns we have heard is the inability for countries to acquire and to merge with other, co with other companies, which really has become an investment barrier um, in Japan or has been um, for quite a bit. Um, we've also um, focused on bid rigging issues and government procurement. Um, we want to talk more about how to increase transparency um, in the Japanese um, um, regulation development um, process. Um, there are issues with respect to um, sanitary and phytosanitary issues, such as food additives. Um, and there's just a whole host of those issues. And so we will be spending, um, you know, time with Japan, um, both in the TPP, but also through our parallel bilateral negotiations to address these issues. So when we are done, um, when we've completed these negotiations, we'll just have a solid package that, in our view, will really, we can show that we really achieved market access um, in Japan. My name is Kunio Kikuchi. I'm with Washington Research and an Analysis. Um, the country that's uh, the closest the geographic neighbor of Japan is uh, Russia. And it's also the country with the longest Pacific coastline. Uh, but uh, today I did not hear anything about Russia. Uh, perhaps you spoke more about North Korea than Russia. But um, my question is, uh, has the U.S. Uh, contemplated inviting Russia to the TPP, or has the Russians made any forays into a possible inclusion in the TPP? Thank you. Well, thank you. And just to be clear, um, the United States doesn't like invite other countries to TPP. Um, basically, we um, we encourage other countries, if they're interested, to let us know of their interest. And interest can be everything from wanting to find out more about the TPP, in which case we would, you know, set up kind of information exchanges. It can be extremely formal um, um, interest expressed, such as Prime Minister Abe did a few months ago. So there are various levels. Um, when Russia chaired APEC um, last year, you know, there was, um, you know, a very um, kind of, they wanted to know more about the TPP, and so through APEC we were able to educate them more. Um, but Russia is an APEC member, and 
all of these regional um, economic um, initiatives are all kind of headed or looking towards the achievement of a free trade area of the Asia Pacific. Could you, could you clarify on FTAP, on, FT, on the free trade area of the Asia Pacific? <clears throat> it is, um, uh, it came out of APEC discussions. Um, is, it a, is APEC membership considered a requirement? Uh, or is or is this something that's still um, to be determined in terms of which countries would be eligible to participate uh, in FTAP? In in FTAP, it, which is, which is not yet a negotiation, but if the goal is eventually to move towards a free trade area of the Asia Pacific, um, and this came out of an of an APEC discussion, mm -hmm. is the concept that APEC membership. Is a requirement for FTAP, or have we not actually drawn that line in any hard way yet? I don't know if people are really, really talking about it as a requirement, but clearly when APEC talked about it, it was talking about these are the 21 economies of the Asia Pacific. So there, you know, there was obviously talk about an interest among APEC members, but I don't. There's nothing in writing, of, you know, what what's required. I was there. I just forgot. Yeah, <laughs> I did too. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Hello, uh, this is Adam Bisuti from Inside U.S. Trade. I just had uh, two quick questions. One is, can you describe, uh, I guess, the nature of Japan's participation in, in the soonest round, possibly in a July round? What what kind of meaningful um, participation will they have at that round? And also, uh, the issue of currency is kind of, uh, kind of under the surface here with Japan joining and, and being brought up by stakeholders uh, that have a concern. Is this an issue that you're addressing bilaterally with Japan, or is this something that you see as being a part of the TPP text or provisions itself, or in any other form, will that be addressed? Um, with respect to when Japan would participate, um, typically we announce the dates for the subsequent round at the round before. Our negotiators are in Lima, so at the end of the Lima round, they will probably announce the dates for the following round. Um, at the same time, we're conducting our 90-day um, um, consultation period. Um, other countries have, are also conducting their domestic pr um, consultations or dom following their domestic procedures. And so how all of this comes together, we'll just have to see. Um, with respect to the currency issue, I can be really brief. Um, we've heard a lot of concerns about currency. Um, and this issue is being reviewed by the administration. Um, you, you knew those two were coming. And then the other one that you probably expected but hasn't been asked, so I'll ask it, okay. is uh, TPA. Um, how does um, TPA um, shape your um, effort to negotiate this? Is it something that can come later? Is it something that has to come sooner? Is it something you are confident will come? How would you characterize it? Um, I would just characterize it by saying that we are consulting with our congressional committees on um, TPA. Okay. <laughs> that, that, yes, Professor Zhang. <laughs> Affiliated with National Development and Reform Commission, China. Uh, I just a concern, you know that China uh, at this stage is not a, a TPP negotiator. But the TPP is a big it's a, uh, it's a big concern for China. So in the near future, how to improve uh, information sharing uh, with China? Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, we through APEC are sharing information um, on TPP and on the negotiations. And when you know countries ask us for information on TPP, we have um, you know entered. We have consulted with them to bring them up to date on what we're doing. So we would um, offer that to any country that's interested in finding out more about the negotiations. Um, Wendy, thank you. Uh, the, um, uh, the morning session had a lot of advice for you that you didn't hear, and my impression is you're doing a lot of it. Um, which is good, and uh, Senator Cardin um, added a few more weights to the scales, <laughs> but it was pretty clear from him in the opening session that uh, members of Congress are very interested in TPP now and generally quite supportive, it appears. Um, with, and a lot of that, as I said earlier, is because Japan's in now, so it's a big 
opportunity um, for um, economic growth across the whole region. So you have a big task in front of you, but I think you've given everyone confidence that once again you'll pull it off. Um, thank you. And let me also conclude by thanking Chairman Ishige and our colleagues at JETRO and Nick Sanchenineri Hirano and our colleagues from the Asia programs for putting together um, what was a really good session for us. This is our eighth. Um, the next session I hope we will have in the new CSIS building, um, which is shiny and wonderful and actually has air and circulation. Um, and then we can invite Wendy back to tell us how